Hey everybody, it's Tim Heidecker. You know me, Tim and Eric, Bridesmaids and uh, Fantastic Four. I'd like to personally invite you to listen to Office Hours Live with me and my co-hosts, DJ Doug Pound. Hello. And Vic Berger. Howdy. Every week we bring you laughs, fun, games, and lots of other surprises. It's live. We take your Zoom calls. Music. We love having fun. Excuse me? Songs. Vic said something. Music. Songs. Music. I like having fun. I like to laugh. I like to meet people who can make me laugh. Please subscribe now. This podcast contains explicit language. If you want to know how explicit, keep listening. Hi, I'm Josh Levine, and this is Hang Up and Listen for the week of June 12th, 2023. On this week's show, The Washington Post's Ben Golliver will join us to talk about the final days, or maybe the final day, of the NBA Finals and what we've learned about the Nuggets, the Heat, and ourselves. Slate's Henry Grabar will also be here to assess the 2023 French Open, where Novak Djokovic won his record 23rd Grand Slam title, and Iga Svantec won her fourth. And finally, Slate's Alex Kirshner and Brendan Porath of the Fried Egg will help us sort out what's going on with the PGA Tour, which has decided all of a sudden that the Saudis' money is totally great and what pro golf has needed this whole time. I'm in Washington, D.C., and I'm the author of The Queen and the host of the podcast One Year. Stefan Fatsis is off this week, and Joel Anderson is still slowly burning, although I must say that the season is moving fast. The third of four episodes of Slow Burn Becoming Justice Thomas is out this Wednesday, and it's a banger. I hope you will all tune in. But anyway, with those gentlemen away, I'm happy to be joined this week by Louisa Thomas. She's a writer for The New Yorker, has a bunch of books to her name, including as co-editor, Losers, Dispatches from the Other Side of the Scoreboard. Louisa, welcome back. It's always good to be back. I saw you nodding when I mentioned Slow Burn, Becoming Justice Thomas. I'm slowly burning through it. It's fantastic. Excellent. Um, You have a story that just came out, we're recording this on Monday, that just came out in the New Yorker about the pitcher, Daniel Bard. It's great. Um, And we're going to talk about it later on in the show. And we will continue that conversation about um, Daniel Bard and his mysterious control problems during our Slate Plus segment. So if you want to hear the whole thing, you need to be a Slate Plus member. You get bonus segments on this show, on Slow Burn, on other Slate shows. You get to listen ad-free. You get unlimited reading on the Slate site. And you get to support us, slate.com slash hangupplus to sign up. By the time you hear this, it's possible the NBA Finals will be over. The Denver Nuggets have a 3-1 series lead over the Miami Heat with Game 5 coming on Monday night in Denver. And while we would be fools to count Miami out, what I just said is objectively true. It could be over. That is all I'm saying. Back off. Um, So would it be totally crazy to reflect on where we were at the start of the playoffs and where we are now? I say no. It's not totally crazy. And to help us with that reflection is our pal Ben Golliver from The Washington Post and the illustrious Greatest of All Talk podcast. We also just learned offline that, Ben, you helped Louisa get on the internet um, game seven of the Boston Miami series. So uh, IT guy as well. A true goat. Uh, Great to see you guys. I would love to claim I'm a jack of all trades, but I'm usually pretty hopeless (laughs) on almost everything. But I can help with Wi-Fi every once in a while and uh, glad to be here to chat finals. Um, The last time we had you on, I think was just before the Lakers Nuggets series. And you talked about Jamal Murray being the decisive factor, which I'm going to say was pretty smart analysis, so bully for you. Um, But the beauty of this Nuggets team, I would argue, is what Murray and Nikola Jokic are able to do together. So I'm going to start there. Um, Ben, what makes them great as a duo? And do you feel like they're following in a tradition of other great NBA tandems, or are they doing something that feels kind of different and original? Well, I think what makes them great as a duo, first of all, is a complete lack of ego, jealousy, or any of the other things that get in the mix here when we talk about modern superstar pairings, right? Um, I mean, Michael Jordan and Scottie Pippen still duking it out on the internet decades later, even though they were incredibly successful. And uh, Pippen clearly has got some uh, harbored resentments, I think, after the fact, right? But with these guys... They don't really care who scores. They don't really get who who care who gets the numbers. They don't care about the contracts. They've both gotten paid. Neither one of them has ever made a push to leave Denver, which is a pretty small market by NBA standards. They're just both pure hoopers who are trying to win, and they've been super laser-focused um, really this entire season, but especially in the playoffs. And that 
is something that we can't take for granted because you look at all these other kind of failed uh, super teams in recent years or even uh, you know partnerships that haven't quite lived up to expectations and so often personality conflicts get in the way um, I want to be the alpha I want the shots of touches you know I, I you know I want to not take the vaccine and not show up to work uh, for a year straight. I mean, you, you get my point. So that's really where it starts. In terms of the basketball fit, though, they both can shoot the ball. They're both great ball handlers. They're both great passers. And so that makes them already uh, better than most players who aren't going to be uh, you know, having that level of a well-rounded skill set. And um, they're great in the pick and roll as well. It's very different because Jokic is able to be the ball handler and, and Murray, the smaller player, is able to set screens. And so they just constantly keep you guessing, constantly keep your uh, defense uh, switching in matchups they don't want to be in. And then they're both so good at finding the open shooters or the open cutters. And we've seen it throughout the finals. That two-man game has set up players like Aaron Gordon or even rookie Christian Brown to have their moment in the sun because they're the guy who gets left wide open when the defense has to focus so much on those other two stars. Uh, Louisa, you wrote about Jokic and you uh, did what I think a lot of us have tried to do is like try to put into words what this guy's deal is, um, both on the court and off the court. And so I guess kind of same question for you. What um, what have you kind of learned about Jokic during these finals and kind of what do you see when you watch him and, and Murray do their dance together? You know, it's funny. I think that um, it is funny both to think of him in isolation and also in tandem. Um, because in isolation, I sort of think of him as this kind of like natural force. Like he's so immovable, you know, he just sort of like seems to have, um, you know, his way both with the ball and um, with with everyone else, honestly. Like, he, it almost seems like at times he's like dictating the movements, not only of his teammates, but his defenders, because he sort of seems to see to see the court and see openings and everything in the way that nobody else does. But there is this kind of like, at the same time, there's this kind of very um, wonderful you know, chemistry. And and one of the things I love watching about him play with Murray is that it, it flows both ways. You know, we obviously are talking about Jokic as the superstar, rightly so, or as like, you know, the the, the real the real alpha. Um, but at the same time, there's, as Ben says, there's no kind of like sense of that between them. It's it's like when they're, you know, it's flowing back and forth constantly. And um, that's what's so fun to watch because it's such a, it's such a kind of dance. You know, they've been doing this for a long time. They have like real kind of, um, this is not something that we're discovering right now, right? Like they were doing this in the bubble before Murray got injured. And so it's something that we feel, I feel like we're like watching in full maturity. I was, I wrote this piece in 2020 about them being like a a, a kind of like a, a buddy movie and almost like a romantic comedy, you know, um, because they just have this kind of like great charisma and chemistry. And I feel like we're watching like the the real fruition of that, of that kind of dynamic between them. Sort of like a, uh... Boban Marjanovic and Tobias Harris, if each of them were like 500% better at basketball. (laughs) Ben, you know, in game four, neither Jokic or Murray had great shooting nights. Uh, Murray had another one of his double digit assist games. Um, You also saw like Michael Porter Jr., who kind of by acclamation is like the number three guy on this team in terms of scoring, still be unable to make anything. And you would think that would be a recipe for the Heat tying up the series at two, um, which did not happen. Some of that is kind of, you can chalk up to, you know, they came through in the clutch. Murray had a bunch of great moments, especially when Jokic was in foul trouble. But um, this just seems to me like a team, maybe unlike any other in the NBA, that actually can succeed when it's two stars, it's two alphas, actually don't even have their best games. Absolutely. Well, one thing we say about championship teams a lot is they can beat you in many different ways, right? So that could be big lineups. It could be small lineups. It could be that they outscore you. It could be that they can, uh, you know, drag your offense uh, back down to earth and, and kind of beat you with a more defensive grinding style. This entire series practically has been played in Miami's preferred style of, you know, slow it down. Don't let Denver get out and run and hit all these three pointers in front of their home crowd at elevation and try to keep everything very controlled where they can kind of grind it out towards the end of games. And we've seen Denver show this amazing ability to adapt. Um, you know, look back earlier in the playoffs. I mean, they're just blowing teams off the court with their offense. And here it's much more about the chess match, the interplay between uh, Denver stars setting up its supporting cast members. And it's, uh, you know, been about those guys being really ready for their moments. I mean, Christian Brown in game three, I felt like he was the headliner. Jokic came out and said, 
this guy won the game for us. And and really, his job was very easy. Just wait for the right moment. Make a very timely cut to the basket. The ball will be waiting for you. They will find you and dunk it. That's all you've got to do. He did it over and over and over again. And it was enough to uh, to break Miami's back. And a similar thing in game four. Uh, Aaron Gordon, a guy who really struggled as a leading offense initiator when he was in Orlando. It was just not the right role for him. They had years and years they were trying to figure out what position should he even play, right? And he gets to Denver, and the whole game opens up uh, wide for him next to Jokic. He gets these easy things going towards the basket. There was that beautiful lob to him where he finished it over his own head. But he was also hitting open three-pointers because there's so much spacing uh, created by the stars. And again, he's just cashing in and, and he was the guy who stepped up. So I think when we look back on this run, assuming that they win it and seal the deal, um, it's going to be a, a situation where it was a phenomenally balanced team. It was a focused teams of most, mostly of guys who had never won before. And they had this real like eye of the tiger kind of vibe to it. And it was a, a whole bunch of guys who maybe didn't have the world's greatest defensive reputations who really stepped up and played hard on that end and were able to beat the Miami Heat at their own game. And that's, that's the story I kind of see developing here. People always talk about the NBA as like a copycat league. And part of me, I mean, I'm sort of like sentimental about this, but it seems like both of these teams are so good at, you know, they're such advertisements for team building, you know, and, and well, I'm going to be interested to see um, the ways in which that is like, you know, a, a kind of repeatable thing um, or whether or not, you know, this is sort of like a, an anomaly. Yeah, no matter which of these teams wins the finals, it'll be five years in a row. Ben, um, that we'll have a new champion. I'm reciting a fact from Louisa's uh, most recent story. Um, and I'm curious if you think that that is, uh, that that says something about the current state of the league, um, if it's an anomaly, um, and also kind of where my a team like Miami goes from here. I mean, I was reading a, a piece by Brian Windhorst where he was saying that just given the CBA and how things are going to change in the next couple of years, that if Miami wants to try to get another star and go that route and sort of, you know, not do the patient team building thing, then this offseason is going to be the time for them to do it. Well, there's there are a couple of things that we should point out. So first of all, you know, Michael Malone was come out and saying everyone should kind of follow our model, right? We drafted Jokic, we drafted Murray, <laughs> uh, drafted Michael Porter Jr. and built around those guys. And you know, this Boston had a similar uh, strategy last year to make the finals. Golden State, obviously, their dynasty was primarily, uh, you know, built through the draft, although they went out and got Kevin Durant and, and Andrew Wiggins as well. And that all sounds well and good, but Denver's model is getting the single greatest return on an investment of any draft pick in NBA history, right? I mean, Jokic is a two time MVP, potentially finals MVP champion coming up here and taken at the 41st pick. You go right through the list of second round picks who have those kinds of accomplishments and it's you're not going to get very far. So um, it's very hard to say that Denver's model is repeatable, is my point. But when you're looking ahead, uh, well, first, let's look back. Why are there five different champions over the last five years? The pandemic was absolutely a factor, right? You had all these scheduling issues. Teams couldn't be rested. They couldn't stay healthy on the short seasons. They weren't able to kind of compete multiple years in a row. You saw the Lakers taken down by that in 2021. One, um, you saw the Heat taken down by that, actually coming off of the bubble year two, where they were just exhausted and went out early in the playoffs. Um, I think the other thing that we've seen here over the last five years, which will kind of carry on going forward, is this idea of can you make it work with three stars and three big contracts on your roster? Or do you have to have a big two model, right? And I think the NBA's new collective bargaining agreement is going to make it very, very difficult to carry three huge salaries and still have enough depth to be a championship contender. So I think by nature of not having that third star on your team, um, there's going to be more parity and you know, you're know you more susceptible to injury if one guy goes down, like with the Lakers, Anthony Davis gets injured, all of a sudden you're no longer a title contender, right? So um, I think we're going to see uh, more parity over the next five years, certainly than we saw during most of the 2010s when it was really dominated by the Heatles and dominated by, uh, you know, the Golden State Warriors dynasty. And those were big three models typically throughout, uh, you know, throughout those years. So it's, you know, kind of get used to it. It's going to be a little bit more of a crapshoot. I do think Denver is pretty well positioned to be in the mix because their main guys are still under 30 and under longer term contract. But just like the Heat, who you mentioned, are going to have some financial decisions here on who they get to keep. 
the Nuggets will too. You know, Joker's contract is going to go up by more than $10 million next year when his new extension kicks in. Um, that's going to create a squeeze, you know, now or, or later. And you, know, you could easily see a situation where they're trying to make a decision. Do we have the ability to keep both Aaron Gordon and Michael Porter Jr.? Or do we have to pick one of those guys and trade the other one and, and try to fill out our bench that way? Uh, that's going to become, I, I think, even more the norm as we're going forward here is, you know, it's one challenge to build a, a title team, but in the new CBA rules where they're really trying to, you know, prevent super teams, prevent dynasties, it's going to be a totally different challenge to keep that title team together. Yeah. And Louisa, I, I think you had talked about um, the kind of patience and uh, of the Denver team building model. And given what Ben said about, you know, the difficulty in trying to put together trios, it might actually open the playing field more for an Oklahoma City or a New Orleans or a, a, a destination that's never going to attract a star free agent and have that kind of glitz and glamour. But I think any team with smart management at least has the hope of acquiring two stars. Um, I, I don't think that's impossible. And so if it's actually better to only have two, than to have three and to like kind of know know your limits and not fly too close to the sun, uh, I, I think maybe Denver will be emulated by a bunch of these uh, other franchises. Yeah, there's also a role for player development here, um, which is something I feel like people are talking about more and more. Um, and so, I mean, that's, that's kind of what I'm interested in looking at going forward. Like, you know, OKC has the San Antonio Spurs old shooting coach, you know, obviously the heat, um, famously has all these kind of, um, undrafted guys or, or, you know, people who the kind of like amazing finds or are performing really well on, on big stages now. And, um, you know, it's not, it's not, you know, written in stone that your draft pick is your, is your destiny. Um, so I think that that's like something that I'm going to be curious about whether or not, um, teams figure out how to do that the way that these teams, it's certainly, um, Denver, you know, we've seen, players improve a lot. So um, I think that's that's going to become more important as these contracts become harder to jigsaw together. Ben, what do you think it means for the NBA if um, the Nuggets do win it, to have the NBA champion be in Denver, to have the acknowledged best player in the world be a guy who um, isn't, uh, a, he's not charismatic, I guess, in a traditional sort of way. Like there are, haven't been entire Nike campaigns built around him. Um, <laughs> like, I, I would love to see the Nike campaign that was built around him. Um, but what do you think um, that means for the league? How will the league sort of like reckon and deal with that? Are we going to see Denver being on national TV 40 times next year? Or are they going to continue to just kind of play second fiddle to the Lakers and, you know, the Celtics in the national conversation? Well, it's a really challenging question to ask. I, I want to paint a picture for you real quick. When we first got to the NBA Finals um, for media day before game one, the Nuggets came out onto the court and they looked around and one of the players said, oh my God, what a circus. You know, he, he can't believe how much media attention had descended upon Denver. And it was so many media members, they had to like kind of build this temporary tent and, and attach it to the arena because the arena is not big enough to hold everybody. And so you go in there, there's all these fans. I mean, it's super hot. You're feeling the sunshine coming through and you're just like, okay, this is obviously their first time on the stage. just kind of all the way around. You know, people are sort of getting used to it. Now we come back for practice on Sunday before game five and the players come out, the same exact situation. They look around and there's only about half as many media members left. And one of the guys says, I guess everybody just stayed in Miami. <laughs> you know, it's like one of the Nuggets players said that. And, and so it was this idea. First, they're adjusting to all the attention. And then I think they're realizing like, well, wait a minute, maybe the fact that we don't um, command as many eyeballs as a Lakers or a Celtics or some of these other prestige franchises, the Warriors, um, is going to change how we're perceived a little bit. And it, it did seem to me one guy was even saying like, is anyone going to show up to my interview today? Because like, there's not <laughs> enough people here to like even uh, man all the different battle stations where they separate these players out for the interview. So it's a challenging, complex question. I think in general, the NBA owners are going to be very happy that a team like Denver can win a title because they want to have a landscape where they feel like the Oklahoma cities or the Portland's or some of these other organizations that have really haven't had a chance against the 
the Joe Lacob Warriors and uh, the Steve Ballmer Clippers in terms of how much they're spending, they're going to see that as a great development. There are more nuggets in the league than there are Lakers. Absolutely. And so the owners are going to be happy to that degree, right? But I mean, in general, I look at the most successful eras of the NBA that everyone talks about and remembers, and it's Showtime Lakers, it's Michael Jordan's Bulls, it's the Heatles, and it's the Warriors here over the last, what, like 30 or 40 years. Nothing about those experiences is comparable to what Denver's doing right now in terms of like hype and interest and, uh, you know, moving uh, the casual fan. And I just don't think it's an accident that, you know, half the media uh, dissipated over the course of this series. I mean, I think to a certain degree, there's an anticlimax because uh, Denver has been so dominant. Everybody just assumes they're going to win game five and go forward and, and kind of finish that off. Um, but I also think that, like, you know, some of the criticism that the Nuggets were facing coming into this series about, well, there's not really a lot of conflict. They don't really have celebrity players. There's not uh, a lot of change narratives that can kind of get the national media excited. Those are going to linger. And I actually kind of think I have a pet theory here. I could see, I mean, Jokic is such a genuinely nice guy. Like he's not ever going to be a villain, but I could see him being cast sort of like as this Rocky villain character next year once he's the big dog, where there's a lot of like joy and excitement coming from various national voices about who can topple the Denver Nuggets, you know, who can topple the big mountain of a man like Louisa. I was describing him earlier, Jokic, you know, he's like the biggest dog out there. Who can knock him off? I think there will be a lot more excitement about trying to take the Nuggets down maybe than there was about building them up here over these last couple of weeks. But for sure, they'll be on Christmas. For sure, they're going to get more uh, national TV slots in this past year. But that's not saying very much, right? I mean, we had the, the national television broadcasters saying, I didn't do a single game for Denver until May, right? So it's like, okay, well, there you go. That kind of tells you where they stood on the pecking order. Well, some of this is their own doing, right? Like, I mean, I know Ben's written about Jokic. I tried, I reached out to the Nuggets and to Jokic's agent um, asking, you know, saying, hi, I want to profile him um, a while ago and and was totally shut down um, by both of them. Um, so part of this seems to be the way they want it. Um, they've had opportunities to get more attention and they've said, no, we want to do things our way, or at least Jokic has, and he's sort of the face of the team. So that's the way the team goes. Um, on the other hand, I still honestly don't understand this argument that they're not kind of marketable because I feel like I have more fun watching Denver's highlights than any other team in the league. Um, I mean, I just think they're so different. They're so cool. They're so, yeah, I mean, I keep coming to this word charismatic because there's something like enchanted about the ball, the way the ball moves around their floor. And I just think like, if the NBA cannot figure out how to market them, whether or not they have, you know, kind of like, their buy-in in, you know, Nike ads or whatever. Like, Nike can make an ad out of highlights. I've seen them do it. You know, the NBA can do this. And, like, the argument that they can is just bonkers to me. Like, and it's lazy. I just don't buy it. Like, I do not buy that you cannot sell this team because this team, to me, is totally, you know, consumable in some way. <laughs> I mean, they're marketable to people that watch basketball, but not everybody who gets marketed to as a basketball fan. I mean, that's just the truth. I guess so. I don't know. I mean, I feel like you put some of these highlights in front of like a non-basketball fan and they'll get it. Well, it's a beautiful game. I think the diehards have embraced the Nuggets. There's no question about it. And the league past, uh, you know, watchers have liked them for a number of years. I just think that Jokic is so unconventional. You almost have to train the casual fan over the course of a long time. And I've seen some of that happen actually during this finals because it feels like there's a lot of people who are just discovering Nikola Jokic right now and they're seeing uh, more than just you know the, the highlight reels and they're looking past just his insane box score lines and seeing some of the puppeteering that he does within the game and really have, having an appreciation for that. And so I think that's a good start. Um, but you know, it's, it's challenging when he doesn't promote himself in any way, when he defers all of the credit. It's a very Tim Duncan-esque type problem. Uh, he's never more excited when uh, than when the PR guy says last question. You know, that's the <laughs> only time he really breaks a smile in his his interviews. And, you know, there's a real gap between him and the reporters who are trying to tell his story on a daily basis, not just, you know, the big profiles, but, you know, what's going through his mind before game five? Well, got to win. You know, so he just he doesn't play along at all. And I think that, you know, in the way that a lot of fans consume basketball these days, which is to not watch full games, which is to, you know, see the funny tweets and, and follow the memes and watch the highlights and, you know, kind of engage with the personality of their favorite star, uh, as opposed to just how he's actually, you know, conducting himself on the court. 
there's a real gap there. But at the same time, clearly, he doesn't need selling to like the Serbian audience, for example, because they've got diehards who are flying halfway across the world and staying up until the middle of the night to watch him play. And so he's got uh, these pockets of fans who really, truly appreciate him. And I think that the challenge is expanding past those bases to uh, to kind of capture everybody's hearts and minds. I'm not totally sure if he's going to do it because, you know, like he doesn't have a lot of the characteristics of of guys like Michael Jordan and Kobe Bryant, you know, flying through the air and the grace and all that. I mean, he has it in his own way, but um, he is a very, very unconventional star. And I think he's sort of perplexed everybody on the marketing side. And I think for years, the NBA was like, well, maybe we're not going to have to market him because is he ever going to be good enough defensively to make it to the finals and compete for championships? You know, there's been a little bit of a surprise and an awakening on that front too, even among the intelligentsia of like, oh, this is a guy, not only is he an MVP, but somebody we really have to take seriously uh, because of what he's done in terms of his own personal growth over these last couple of seasons. Ben Golliver writes about the NBA for the Washington Post. You should also listen to him on the Greatest of All Talk podcast and um, get in touch with them for all your Wi-Fi needs. Ben, thank you so much. All right, take care. Hopefully we didn't jinx this, you know, and we're not going back to like Miami and <laughs> making this a, a longer <laughs> series. Up next, Slate's Henry Grabar joins us to talk about the French Open. Now that it's summer, you might be looking for wholesome, convenient meals for sunny, active days. Factor, America's number one ready-to-eat meal kit, can help you fuel up fast with flavorful and nutritious ready-to-eat meals delivered straight to your door. You'll save time, eat well, and stay on track reaching your goals. I am excited to receive the Factor ready-to-eat meal kit. I'm looking forward to trying out all of the different options and flavors and it's dietitian approved. There's less than or around 550 calories per serving. You can choose from delicious flavor-packed options each week to fit a variety of lifestyles from keto to calorie smart, vegan and veggie, and protein plus. This June, get Factor and enjoy eating well without the hassle. Simply choose your meals and enjoy fresh flavor-packed meals delivered to your door. Ready in just two minutes, no prep, no mess. Head to factormeals.com slash hangup50 and use code hangup50 to get 50% off your first box. That's code hangup50 at factormeals.com slash hangup50 to get 50% off your first box. On Sunday in Paris, Novak Djokovic beat Kaspar Ruud in straight sets to win the French Open and a whole lot more. He became the first man ever to win all four major tournaments at least three times. And with his 23rd overall Grand Slam, he passed Rafael Nadal for the most ever for a male singles player and tied Serena Williams' open era record for all players. Joining us now is my Slate colleague, Henry Grabar. Henry was at the French Open, which makes me very jealous. He's also the author of the extremely well-reviewed new book, Paved Paradise, How Parking Explains the World. Welcome, Henry. Hey, Josh. So... The story of Novak Djokovic's career has always been about his struggle to claim the spotlight for himself. Or maybe it's not the entire story of his career, but that's one story. Um, he's never gotten the love that has seemed to come so easily for Nadal and especially Roger Federer. And it's funny, even as you'd think that this tournament without the injured Nadal or the retired Federer um, around to hog the spotlight, you would think it would be Djokovic's coronation. I was still left feeling a little bit disappointed because there was so much buildup to this intergenerational showdown with Carlos Alcaraz and the semis. It was living up to its billing after two sets, just dynamic, exciting. You don't know how it's going to end. And then Alcaraz starts cramping up and it kind of fizzles out. Um, did you feel the same kind of disappointment that I did, Henry? No, I thought it was pretty great. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, we could talk about the Djokovic um, Alcaraz showdown in a moment because I, I know it ended in disappointment, but I think the first two sets were thrilling and like some of the best tennis I've ever seen in my life and um but over the whole of the tournament I think Djokovic's performance was so extraordinary and so dominant that to me it you know it, it was as far as coronations go it felt like a more powerful statement of 
just how far above the rest of the field he is right now um, than it would have been if um, he'd been in a bunch of um, five set matches. And I think the dominant statistic that sums this up for me is that he was in a bunch of tiebreakers over the course of the tournament and he did not make a single unforced error in any of those tie breaks. Yeah, that's just disgusting, Louisa. <laughs> I think it was 55 points. Yeah, no, truly, truly revolting. Um, what did you make of this couple of weeks for Djokovic? And it was funny, like, seeing Tom Brady and his player box. Apparently, they were, like, BFFs but had never met before. It just feels like putting Tom Brady in your player box is sort of— it's like the equivalent of wearing that, like, 23 pullover after the match. He's like, I'm the greatest. But isn't he? I mean, it is a, a debate that is, um, you know, not even a debate anymore, to be honest. Um, and it hasn't been for a long time. I, I'll spot him Tom Brady. <laughs> um, I think, you know, I, I think that he is pretty um, happy to to be um, in a spot where he doesn't have to sort of look to his right and left and see Roger Federer or Rafael Nadal um, right now. Maybe he can see Brady and Serena for a brief moment before he searches ahead, um, which I imagine he will do very soon, probably in a month at Wimbledon. But, you know, he's astonishing. I mean, that, that tiebreak stat is, is truly remarkable. But so is, you know, that you mentioned that Alcaraz match. The way he has of, of taking opponents out of a match before it even really begins. I mean, Alcaraz himself said it was the tension, you know, that he sort of exhausted himself. He was cramping was, was what happened in that match. Um, he's severely, so severely cramping that Alcaraz gave up a game um, because he couldn't deal with it. Um, and he had to have medical timeout um, before, before the game was over. And... And he said, you know, this is what he does. And we've seen that again and again and again. He just like, you know, takes the legs off of guys. He just absolutely asks you to do too much. There's this quote from Goran Ivanizovic, who's been um, a, a coach of Djokovic's, which is, I, I found uh, pretty hilarious, which is that Andy Roddick has said of Djokovic, this is from Matthew Futterman's story in the New York Times, um, that first he comes for your legs and then he comes for your soul. And Henry Ivanizovic added on to it. Then he digs your grave and you have a funeral and you're dead. Bye bye. Thanks. Thank you for coming. Well, that puts kind of a fine point on it. <laughs> yeah, that, that that actually is pretty well sums up the match that I, I saw him play in person, which was against uh, Martin Fucevic, the Hungarian who put up a good fight. This is one of the night matches at Roland Garris. So the crowd that was there had come exclusively to see this one match. So they were hoping for um, a good uh, competitive spectacle. And while they usually do get behind Novak, because I think they admire what a competitor he is, and also he speaks a little bit of French, which which always charms them at the end of the match, um, they wanted it to be interesting. And Martin put up a pretty good fight in the first set and took it to a tiebreak. And then, as we were discussing, tiebreak Novak um, came out of the woodwork. And that's a pattern that he displayed across nearly every single match he played at this French Open, where sometimes he would falter or he would come out slow at the beginning. Um, and then he would just click into this higher gear. And it was like, it took him a moment to to get in the zone. Um, but then, you know, he, I, I don't think he uh, went to five sets a single time. Um, and, uh, and, and with the exception of the, uh, the match against uh, Carlos Alcaraz Garfia, I, I don't think that he lost a, a set after the first one, which he dropped against uh, Kashinov. And, uh, and maybe that was the only one. Um, Louisa, I think, um, you know, when we talk about Alcaraz feeling the tension and struggling physically, we can be reminded of a young star named Novak Djokovic, who had lots of trouble with his stamina, with stress and matches. I mean, it feels like it's almost literally decades ago at, at this point. Maybe I need to temper my disappointment by noting that while Alcaraz has the look and feel of an all-time great. He has the game for it. He showed at the U.S. Open that he can come through in these situations and in tight matches. He's not at his in his prime yet. He's not at his physical prime. He's not, I guess, in his mental prime. And this is a thing that happens, is that 
Federer and Nadal and Djokovic didn't exactly overlap in terms of where their careers were and being in the exact right place. And when, you know, there is that moment, like in the famous Wimbledon final between Nadal and Federer, where it seems like the lines are crossing, that's just such a rare moment when both players are at the exact right place at the right time. And this just wasn't it. It's not it for Alcaraz and Djokovic right now this year. I mean, Carlos Alcaraz is is a baby. You know, he's just turned 20. He's He's got time um, and time and time and time. Um, Novak Djokovic is, is 36. Um, I mean, think about that for a second. Um, I think Alcaraz um, has a very different mindset than Djokovic, um, or at least at this point in his life and career. Um, but yeah, I mean, I think that, I think that some of this comes, um, from experience. There are advantages to, to being young. There are advantages of, to playing with the kind of freedom, um, before you know how hard it is to get back, um, and how painful it is to lose. Um, but there are disadvantages too. I mean, Novak Djokovic's transformation, um, both physical and mental is, you know, one of the most remarkable stories of sport, um, particularly the mental transformation, as you mentioned, um. And, and, you know, that's going to be Alcaraz's, obviously Alcaraz has the gifts. There's no question. And, you know, whether or not he's going to be able to become one of those players who, um, you know, tennis is played on such fine margins and whether or not he's going to be able to become one of those players who is able to sort of lock down in the tightest moments and just win those, you know, tie breaks every single time or win those tight matches every single time. Um, I guess that's the only question for him. Yeah, and we've gone through this whole segment without talking about the, you know, vaccination issue and the deportation from Australia. And, you know, maybe what that suggests to me is that, um, you know, over the next few years or when he retires, like maybe the fact that he has this record, he's probably not going to give it away. Like maybe that's all going to trump everything that we were all so in, enraged about and that was so controversial during his career. Like, being great <laughs> at sports, Henry, tends to make people forget, um, you know, it's, I don't know if it's more than a peccadillo, but it's just like, this seems like it's going to be the top line for him for most people. Yeah, and I think the most important thing is that he has the respect of his peers. They all seem to really, really like him and everyone says he's a pretty nice guy. And I think that, you know, whatever you think about the vaccination stuff and the Serbian nationalism, um, it's clear that as a competitor, they all have a lot of respect for him. And I think if you watch him, you see that too on the court. Like, yeah, he jaws a little bit with the umpires, but when Alcaraz hit that insane shot where he ran back and spun around and then shot it down the line, um, and you saw Novak giving him a little applause, you know, I think that's the, they all seem to have that impression of him as, as basically a good sport. And I think that counts for a lot. Louisa, Iga Svantec set her own set of records, albeit on a smaller scale um, at this French Open. She has uh, four slam titles. She's now the youngest player since Serena Williams to win her fourth. Um, she's had this incredibly long run of being number one. She kind of bridled a little bit at the Iga's Bakery meme. And when you get when you beat somebody six love, that's a bagel. When you beat them six one, it's a, a breadstick. She's like, that's not respectful to my opponents. And you know what she showed in this final, and if you could talk us through it, that would be great, um, is that she had the mental fortitude to win a non-bakery match, one in which she was way up and then should seem like she was down and out, and she pulled through. Yeah, I mean, she came out um, playing her typical dominant form. Um, and Mukova, um, her opponent, who is this really super talented um, but oft injured um, Czech, she was kind of seemed totally overwhelmed. Um, Iga very quickly won the first set and went up 3-0. Um, and it sort of had the feeling, I, I mean, I actually texted, <laughs> texted someone saying, like, I think this could be over very soon. Um, boy, was I wrong. Um, and the question with Iga had been, um, you know, what would happen when she got in a fight? Because so far, um, I've actually um, compared her game to Djokovic, um, who's, who's, it does remind me of it stylistically, but what she doesn't have is Djokovic's, you know, um, kind of 
bulletproof mentality in tight situations um, because what we're used to seeing is her just completely run over her opponents um, or struggle, you know, mentally. You know, I, I mean, I've seen her sob, you know, I've seen her with a towel on her head, you know, I've seen her sort of um, be very open about how, um, you know, facing this, the kind of pressure and expectations that come with being number one is, is hard for her. Um, and so there was some question when, you um, when her opponent, uh, Mukova, mounted this really thrilling and beautiful comeback, you know, how she would deal. And the way she dealt was by clamping down and 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 running away with the third set at the end. And it was truly impressive. Um, and what had seemed like a kind of um, very, you know, par for Iga's course, um, you know, blowout turned into be a really thrilling match. And, um, yeah, a truly, truly exciting, um, but also kind of affirming uh, match for how great, Iga is and, you know, what, how dominant her place is at the top of the game right now. Well, it's really, it's been a dominant run by Iga Shiontek, but challenged very forcefully by Arena Sabalenka this year, also to some extent by Alina Rybakina. They've kind of been the big three. Um, and it looked, Henry, like Sabalenka was going, it was going to be another showdown between them and this year's final until Mukova beat Sabalenka in a really kind of classic match in the semis. But Sabalenka had a very fascinating tournament um, this, uh, you know, last two weeks. And you witnessed some of it, right? Yeah, so she had won the Australian Open and came in as the number two seed. And um, I saw her play uh, in person on Susan Langlin against um, Elena Svitolina, who's the Ukrainian player who's mounting this comeback from um, giving birth uh, last fall. Uh, Svitolina is also married to Gail Monfils, um, the French tennis superstar. Uh, and finally, of course, she's Ukrainian and Sabalenka is Belarusian. So when those two came up against each other and there was a kind of tension about the match um, because Svitolina had been outspoken um, both about the war and also had made this very conspicuous decision not to shake hands with any of her Russian and Belarusian opponents. Um, and uh, and Sabalenka... Similarly, Sabalenka's first round opponent, Ukrainian, didn't shake her hand. Right. And, And Sabalenka, at the same time, had been criticized for not being sufficiently demonstrative in her opposition to the war. And in particular, um, in her relationship with the Belarusian president, um, Alexander Lukashenko. So um, there was a lot of tension going into that match. And it was a pretty good match. Uh, I thought Svitolina put up a good fight. But Sabalenka was so dominant in the end um, that uh, I really thought she was going all the way. And I think Sabalenka Mukova, for me, was maybe like the best match of the entire tournament. Um, It was just so intense and, and so... It was really close also. And, and I think, I wonder if, if that didn't take, take a bit of a toll on Mukova. She headed into that final. And Sabalenka, you know, Louisa, she skipped one of her press conferences at Roland Garros. She, um, when she did do a press conference after the, the following round, she did actually publicly disavow Lukashenko in a way that was really surprising and brave. And, um, you know, just as you look up and down the draw, um, especially on the the women's side, it was just Ukrainian versus Russian, Ukrainian versus Belarusian, the whole tournament. And then in the final, Iga Svantec has, you know, worn the Ukrainian colors on her hat. You know, she's Polish and has been very, probably the most outspoken player outside of those two countries about the war. Um, and so it was, especially going into Wimbledon, which we'll be allowing this year, the Russian and Belarusian players who were banned previously, um, it was a, a really um, striking sort of uh, you know demonstration of the the tensions both in the sport as a whole and I think among the players. Absolutely, I mean it was the storyline really going into um, before the final. I think it um, it kind of took a backseat to to the final as it happened um, because it wasn't Sabalenka playing um, Sviantek. I think if Sabalenka had had been playing Sviantek, that still would have been um, a large part of what we were talking about. Um, you know, these players are are somewhat put in a tough spot. Um, I don't want to kind of excuse anyone for um, 
you know, not, not calling out things where they see them, but, um, you know, uh, Lushenko is, is, I, I'm pretty sure appoints the head of the Belarus. I mean, he was at Fed Cups. I mean, it's, it would be a big deal. You know, she was being criticized for appearing in pictures, um, with him. And there are a lot of pictures of Sabalenka and the Belarusian president. Um, and, you know, at the same time, it's sort of hard to imagine, um, you know, those situations at the Fed Cup, let's say, where she's, um, you know, she's she's turning down, you know, she's saying, no, don't be in the picture with me um, where you're showing up at a Fed Cup match. Um, you know, I think I think it's it's sort of it is hard at the same time. Obviously, the what the Ukrainian players are living through um, every day and their families are living through is keeps that issue on the forefront for them every single day. You know, they wake up, they check their phone, they see what's happening in their hometowns, um, you know, and their parents are there, or their fathers are there. And it's sort of like an issue that has obviously taken a backseat to others in the U.S., but for on the tennis tour because of the, you know, the way the 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 international um, landscape plays out in, in this sport, um, it is very much on the forefront and it really, really played out um, in this tournament. Henry, just before you go, um, since you're in Paris, I wanted to ask you about Lionel Messi going to Miami um, and kind of what the reaction has been there. Um, the response at the in Messi's last match in Paris was not uh, cheers and acclamation. And he has said openly that he had a very bad time. And so I, I don't personally blame you for that. Um, but I'm just wondering what the vibes are around Messi and his decision to go to America. You don't blame me for that? I, I, I'm definitely not to blame. But the experiment just didn't work. I think... PSG has won the French League something like 10 years in a row now. And so when Messi showed up playing alongside Kylian Mbappe and Neymar, um, the expectation was that they were going to win the Champions League and anything less than a Champions League victory was a disappointment. And that didn't happen. And so I think the um, the the kind of the whole vibe at the Parc des Princes has been a sense of disappointment about it not really working out despite moments of brilliance. And so I don't think they really begrudge Messi on a personal level for leaving. Mbappe has talked about leaving as well. Um, I think that they're just, it's just disappointing that this this team of superstars didn't really ever manage to pull it together and they never even made it to the Champions League final. And then as far as his departure goes, I think the Parisians can probably agree with I think every other soccer fan in the world, that it's pretty hilarious that he was offered hundreds of millions of dollars a year to play in Saudi Arabia, and he's a Saudi Arabian tourism ambassador, <laughs> and yet still at the end of the day, he was like, oh, I'd rather be in Miami. Uh, I can relate. Also, just last question, how is the parking at the French Open? Well, Josh, you know me, I rode my bicycle, and there was <laughs> valet parking for bikes at the French Open. Um, I can't even imagine the parking situation. Just the scene on the sidewalks outside coming from the metro is totally chaotic, especially for the early days. And I think it's smart because like a tennis, well, I don't even know what you call it, like a facility, a tennis compound, compound. Uh, it only gets used like it was being used for Roland Garros once a year. And so it really would be tremendously wasteful to build thousands of parking spaces. So I think it's natural that on the first few days of the tournament, when you've got all the plays on the outdoor courts, that it's totally chaotic. And I think that's that's part of the fun. Henry's book is Paved Paradise, and you should also check out the stories he filed from the French Open. Thank you, Henry. Thanks for having me. And Louisa, you're going to step away for a moment, but you will be back with us for the rest of the show. So do not fear. Up next, Alex Kirshner and Brendan Porath on the PGA Tour, deciding that, hey, maybe it does want to take Saudi Arabia's money. Reboot your credit card with Apple Card, the credit card created by Apple. It gives you unlimited daily cash back that you can now choose to grow in a high-yield savings account at 4.15% annual percentage yield. That's more than 10 times higher than the national average savings rate. Apply for Apple Card now on the Wallet app on iPhone and start growing your daily cash with savings today. Apple Card subject to credit approval. 
Savings is available to Apple Card owners, subject to eligibility requirements. Savings accounts provided by Goldman Sachs Bank USA, member FDIC. National average savings rate is from FDIC website. Terms apply. This episode is brought to you by SAP. Welcome to The Window, the window of opportunity. When your next move can either make your business famous or obsolete, so you need to be ready. Be handling good surprises and bad ones ready. B. Opening a Portland, Houston, and Providence location on the same day ready. B. Stock options plus paid family leave ready. SAP has been there. It can help you be ready for anything that happens next. Because it will. Be ready with SAP. A year ago today, CBS's Jim Nance asked PGA Tour Commissioner Jay Monahan to share his thoughts on the then-brand-new Live Golf Tour, the insurgent, Saudi-funded enterprise that was yanking away a bunch of famous players with big money offers. What Nance asked about specifically was a letter from a group called 9-11 Families United, which accused the golfers who went to live of sports washing and betraying the United States. Here's what Monahan had to say about that. As it relates to the families of 9-11, I have two families that are close to me that lost loved ones. And so my heart goes out to them. And I would ask, you know, any player that has left or any player that would ever consider leaving, have you ever had to apologize for being a member of the PGA Tour? So, yeah, now in 2023, Monaghan and the PGA Tour have taken that Saudi money themselves. After that deal got announced last week, Connecticut Senator Chris Murphy tweeted, So weird. PGA officials were in my office just months ago talking about how the Saudis' human rights record should disqualify them from having a stake in a major American sport. I guess maybe their concerns weren't really about human rights. Joining me now to discuss what is going on here is Brendan Porath. Brendan is the editor of the website The Fried Egg, and he's a co-host of the Shotgun Start podcast. Brendan, thanks for coming on the show. Thanks so much for having me. Really appreciate it, Josh. And also with us is Slate contributing writer Alex Kirshner. Before we get going with the golf discussion, I'd like to tell everyone that Alex, a man of many talents, is co-hosting a live edition of his college football podcast, Split Zone Duo. It's this Thursday night, June 15th, here in Washington, D.C. at Penn Social. I will be there. You should come check it out. It'll be a good time. Hello, Alex. Hey, Josh. Great to see you. And great to be with Brendan, a former colleague and uh, co-host of the greatest golf podcast around, The Shotgun Start. You're too kind. Alex, why don't you start um, on the second greatest golf podcast of all time by going into a little bit more detail. About what exactly is the deal that the PGA Tour has struck with the Saudis? It's an interesting question because the PGA Tour's public pronouncement about the deal left a ton of questions that I know Brendan and others have spent days trying to answer uh, about the operational nuts and bolts and about the financial guarantees that these parties are making to each other and and just the workflow of how this will all come together. And I think we've started to learn a little bit more through reporting and leakage over the last couple of days in the Wall Street Journal and the New York Times and elsewhere that I think it's fair to say indicates that this is mostly going to be an arrangement where the PGA Tour has board voting control and can continue to run tournaments in a way that it has run them forever, but that the Saudi Arabian Public Investment Fund will have significant financial muscle in some as yet un- undescribed in complete detail entity that it's spinning up with the PGA Tour. Uh, and, and this is going to mean more handholding, more cooperation between what had until recently been two significant rivals. Does that seem right to you, Brendan? Yes, I think so. And I think one thing to be clear is there's there's not a lot of clarity right now. So this this process was pretty ham fisted. It was quick. Um, it was rolled out in sort of an unprepared way. Uh, there aren't a lot of details. There are very high level sort of frameworks. This board control. There's the Saudis will be the. There's a new entity which is the new co. That's a for profit entity. The PGA Tour remains a five hundred one c six nonprofit as a part of that, under that. So they are staying um, as they are, running the tournaments they've always run, uh, potentially. Uh, this new company would be solely funded, new entity, for-profit, will be solely funded by Saudi Arabia with a PIF, with a right of first refusal 
for any other new funding, meaning should a private equity company want to come in and kick a billion dollars in, uh, the Saudis could just say, no, we'll do it. We, we will, con-, you know, and, and I think that in a way enhances that sort of, um, I don't know if it's soft power or soft control, but whether they don't have majority board control or not, it's certainly a form of influence as uh, Alex alluded to. So I think everyone's trying to sort of understand how this will play out. The PGA Tour uh, has certainly been working hard to communicate that they will maintain control, that they have majority control, that they've just brought in the Saudis as a partner to pump billions into whatever they want to do on their terms. Um, and I just don't know that the Saudis typically work that way and don't spend billions of dollars just to kind of hang out in the corner of the room. So uh, I think what a lot of people are coming to understand is we don't know how this is going to look. There are some real fluid um, parameters. And of course, you've got, as we record this, I, I have a, an unsolicited thousand word email from an M&A attorney. So we're all start, <laughs> sort of trying to figure it out and my, and my other tab open. So, and they seem confused about how it's going to look. And just the general consensus is this was done really quickly for, for this type of deal. And there's a lot of unknowns of, of how it'll look. I mean, Alex, as we were all following this last week, one of the things that was so striking was that we were seeing the PGA Tour players in real time respond just like we were saying, <laughs> Mackenzie Hughes saying, nothing like finding out through Twitter that we're merging with a tour that we said we'd never do that with. And, you know, my understanding, um, and we follow lots of different sports, is that commissioners generally serve at the pleasure of their bosses, whether it's the owners and the, you know, NFL, NBA, whatever. In this case, um, you know, the players, uh, I think, would be in charge of deciding, uh, you guys tell me if I'm wrong, would be in charge of deciding whether Jay Monahan continues to have a job. And so I found this very confusing that he wouldn't try to drum up support, but would instead just like break this to them like, hey guys, this is what we're doing. Yeah, the PGA Tour bills itself as what it calls a player run organization. And I have some questions about that. Yeah, there are certainly a lot of the players have, have always maintained it's never been a player run organization. And this is the latest, most shining example of that. Um, but it's not like a traditional league. There aren't there's a collective bargaining agreement with a, a group of owners or a league. Um, the players are all, quote unquote, independent contractors. They still have a contract with their tour where they have to kind of stay within the lines. They don't have their own media rights and things like that. But um, it is a unique structure. It's one that made them particularly vulnerable to something like this, a billion dollar threat or, or some unlimited foreign wealth fund. Um, but that is that is a part of this deal that was done so secretively, was done with only four people in the room, uh, Jay Monahan, two of his policy board executives, Ed Herlihy, who's a, a, a Wall Street lawyer at Wachtell, and Jimmy Dunn, the sort of legendary Wall Street banker, uh, both of whom are Augusta National members, uh, who are also tied up in, in, and would like to not be tied up in the dis- litigation and discovery. So there's all sorts of questions about who was in the room, th- this player-run organization, who was representing it. Did it need to be secretive? Probably, based on how it was done. But a- as Jay Monahan said in an interview last week, when he was, uh, you know, put the screws to him about his 9/11 comments. He said he let confidentiality prevail, and and he was referring to not letting know letting some of the 9/11 families know this was coming or communicating with them. And I'd say confidentiality prevailed uh, in a lot of ways here, uh, and obviously most acutely with with keeping the 9/11 families in the dark. But certainly the players who run this organization or have some level of power through different advisory boards had no clue and almost no say. And it was four men in a room that got this done. So the thing that this reminds me of, um, we had a conversation on this show a, a couple of months ago about the women's tennis tour and just how adamant that it was about, you know, after Peng Shui's, um sexual assault allegations and the fact that she disappeared and the um, tennis association was unable to contact her, a, a, a player that had been a member of this tour, they were just so adamant. We're not doing business with China. We're pulling out of China. We're not doing anything with China. And lo and behold, now, a little while later, we're going back to China. And essentially what they said was, we couldn't, and they're very transparent about it, you know, we couldn't take the revenue hit. 
And it seems like, Alex, what the reporting has been um, over the last few days is that the litigation that the PGA Tour was involved in um, over Live and with all this, these kind of antitrust allegations, um, that they couldn't afford to keep fighting, you know, that this was going to cost them on the order of hundreds of millions of dollars to keep, you know, fighting with Saudi Arabia. And I guess ultimately what that shows me is that the success or failure, the per- our perceived, our perception of the success or failure of Live as a tour had no bearing on that. Um, and that Saudi Arabia, no matter whether Liv ever made any revenue, could continue throwing money, whether it's in court or anywhere else, at the PGA Tour until, you know, from a financial standpoint, it it had to surrender. Yeah, nobody's money is truly limitless, but the Saudis is close enough. It's in the ballpark if you're approximating things. And it's not just that it's expensive to fight legal battles, but it's also that to play defense sort of with carrots rather rather than sticks, the PGA Tour did some things in response to Liv's emergence that are expensive. They started, they announced a plan and, and have put it into effect in the last few years to pay players basically for their media notoriety and how much attention they're bringing to the sport. I think that's going to cost tens, hundreds of millions of dollars over the long run. They've started implementing a 12 plus tournament a year system. Brendan could correct me on the number of elevated events that they call them where the purses are much bigger. Uh, and players get paid a lot more in an effort to compete with the guaranteed deals that live players get. And that costs money. Uh, and the PGA Tour hadn't exactly said how they're funding that. I think when they announced the plan, when Jay Monahan did, he said, oh, you know, we're going to figure this out with increased sponsor contributions. And we're going to pull together as a golf community to protect our tour. But the Times had reported a couple of days ago that actually they had not been able to make up all of that money that they were spending. They were dipping into a reserve fund to pay out their players as a defensive mechanism against Live, And that just isn't entirely tenable forever. So there's some leverage for the Saudis there. And I think it's part of why people might be a bit skeptical that the PGA Tour got as good of a deal as its messengers are indicating that it did. It's certainly a change in what we've heard now. We've heard a, it's a change in a lot of the messaging we've heard over the last year, a quick and sudden flip. But everything we understood was that they were financially in a strong position. Um, of course, this was, uh, this was costly, but it wasn't fatal. It wasn't sort of needing to push them into a corner to do a deal. That's nothing we'd heard uh, ha- had suggested this was coming. Now, of course, it may be have more may have been more problematic than they'd ever let on, and that's very clear. But this seems like a kind of after the fact messaging that we're now they're communicating. Look, we needed to do this. It sort of takes some agency away from jumping in the Saudi pool. It takes some of the choice of like we had to do it. We were getting blood dry. Uh, the legal costs. I don't know. You talk to someone, they say they were significant. They're obviously they're they're sizable, and the Saudis could do that forever. But if a billion dollar sports league, you know, this has now become the first time we've heard this was so problematic. I do think more serious was what Alex talked about, bumping purses to try to keep up in the arms race, bumping purses for these designated events to 20 million. And like we talked about the unique tour structure. Yeah, there's a large rights deal. But aside from that, it's going to sponsors. It's going to whatever AT&T or Bank of America or whatever to sponsor certain events. And they had to keep going to these certain set of sponsors. Hey, your purse just went from twelve million to twenty million, and now it's probably got to go to twenty-five. And it, it's just going. And you have to start kicking in more money to to pay out to these star players. They had to keep going around the country and asking, or the world, and asking for more money. And I think that's where it started to become a bit more painful, and where they felt a little more cornered that we can't keep up, even as this entity that they're up against is totally floundering has no viewers, is burning through billions of dollars, does not look like a sustainable model in any way. Rumors of, of the Saudis growing impatient with its, with its sort of lack of success. It was really a weak moment for Liv, this, this kind of this spring. And so uh, this is really the first time we heard that the litigation costs and sort of the, the bump in, in operations for the PGA Tour were really getting painful. And I think... I'm sort of skeptical of of how painful it was. Is that just messaging after the fact? 
to take some of the agency away of, of we're jumping in the pool with the Saudis. And it sounds more palatable than saying, we saw billions of dollars more and we wanted it, as opposed to we were in some trouble and we needed it. Yeah, that's a really good point. And I also wanted to ask you, Brendan, about um, kind of live players versus PGA Tour players in this moment. Um, you had Phil Mick Mickelson basically taking a victory lap, saying this is an awesome day. The guy who had been pilloried for saying, yeah, the Saudis execute people for being gay, but this is a once in a lifetime opportunity to reshape how the PGA Tour does business. And I was like, oh, OK, I guess. Maybe you were right, and now you're you're like you know saying telling everyone um, that you know maybe uh, you had it right all along. You have Bryson DeChambeau who also left for live, saying I feel bad for these you know poor PGA Tour <laughs> players who stayed behind and like we got our you know nine figure deals and they just got left kind of holding the bag. Um, but is there also the the specter of? these live players, you know, being punished in some way? Are the PGA Tour players, are they going to be somehow rewarded with equity for staying? Like, what? how is all of this going to shake out, do you think? Yeah, there was sort of the facile analysis to run to winners and losers. And that's how everything was broken down from a deal that there weren't a lot of details about. I think the clear winners are the Saudis they got at the table. Um, I think the clear initial losers, or as was outlined, were the players who passed up $150 million or $40 million, whatever it is, based on their stature for a league that then ended up coming back to them anyways, right? And that their friends who left are now coming back with their, their big upfront cash. But as we've come to learn a little bit more on the structure of the deal, per Jimmy Dunn, who was in the room uh, and sort of the architect of it, that the players who passed up those large upfront payments stayed loyal to the PGA Tour, so to say, will be getting an equity stake in this new company, this new for-profit entity. Uh, however many that is, is it the top 10 name brand guys, top 12? Um, you know, that's a big debate amongst golf. Like how many guys actually put fans in the seats and, and get sponsors and tune in? We'll see how many get an equity stake in this new company. Um, then there's apparently, according to Jimmy Dunn, it was an ESPN report, there will be some sort of panel set up to assess who and who will be reintegrated back into the PGA Tour and how and at what penalty. So it'll be uh, like I Rory McIlroy, a 9/11 <laughs> widow. I mean, I don't mean to be. I don't mean to be. <laughs> right. Glib. No. I don't mean to be glib, but it's just like um, imagining what that panel would look like, and I mean, it's just kind of an absurd idea. Right. And I think it's it's sort of evidence of, of sort of the quick and ham-fisted way this came together without a lot of the longer term operational implications. Uh, I think the one penalty will be not this equity stake unavailable. That seems like a kind of black and white thing at this moment, right? You, Phil Mickelson's not going to have a chance to buy in on this equity or, or get a grant of some equity to this new new company. The panel for me, I, I don't know how that will work. You know, if you said more nasty things in the press, is that an extra $5 million? Is that an extra 10 event suspension? It seems incredibly gray and hard to understand how that will work. And, and I don't know that Phil should be taking victory laps. Probably should. Uh, from a public perspective, it looks like what he did. He was on the right path and, and or, you know, business wise but live is gone he probably won't have a place to play jay monahan is uh, rory called him his boss again i don't know that phil phil is necessarily feeling great about his future outside of the majors but he certainly has um a lot to puff his chest out about based on how this all unfolded they're not gonna do it but to me the simplest thing is you make all of these live guys give like four to five shots per tournament for the first three <laughs> years that they're back on the tournament. They all start plus five. See how they like that. <laughs> There's a lot of creative ways that they could, uh, uh, you know, in theory, bat around bringing guys back. The, the, the thing to me is that, you know, more some players have been more palatable about their defection. You know, Dustin Johnson, Brooks Kepka, others. There's like this sort of value and stated value and not always raking your former tour over the coals. I don't know what that means. I, guys are some guys are more liked and others are not. And you know, Phil Mickelson was drawing up operational documents for a rival tour while a member of the PGA Tour a year ago. That seems like significant 
breach an issue that will have to be assessed when he's brought back. That's something that's more substantial than Dustin Johnson just saying, I saw you know an opportunity for my family and I wanted to leave. Like, There's obviously a lot of holes in all the reasoning, but there are various levels of, I don't know, betrayal that they'll have to sort out if they can. And it's funny because just last week we were talking about how, you know, Liv was a joke. This, I mean, I, I'm not going to say we, like I was saying this, like Liv was a joke. The Saudi golf thing was just a total failure. And it just looked like Messi going to Saudi Arabia was in the bag and things just have totally flipped in the span of one week. And I wonder if it's as simple as it's easier to buy corporations than it is people, especially people who don't need nine figures. I, I mean, I, I don't, know if we can make kind of grand pronouncements over one man's decision and what that says about the Saudis kind of larger project around soccer, which I think centers around hosting the 2030 World Cup. But uh, I mean, it it just seems like you can never um, underestimate a corporation's willingness to take the most amount of money from whoever is offering it. And that's like a lesson that I think I and maybe other people need to learn repeatedly over and over again. That was that was certainly an issue with, with some of the early defections and sort of the early, the, the horse race to figure out who was going. There were brand name players, Rory McIlroy, Tiger Woods, Hideki Matsuyama and his standing and his corporate sort of uh, appeal in Japan that like, as it was explained to me, there isn't really an amount of money that is, it's, they're in a different stratosphere where there's so many opportunities outside of golf, after golf, that taking a hundred, 400 million, taking whatever it may be, it, it's not a mon, it's not a pure money thing. And they are such big, separate kind of clean brands, so to speak, or individuals. As Rory once said, I still use the same three rooms in my house. The house is a lot bigger. I have a lot more money, but I still go in the same three rooms. There's sort of a status that that it was almost um, like you're saying with individuals. They were comfortable, and 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 there was a separate sort of uh, carrot at play outside of the money for the PGA Tour and golf. The Saudi money was always coming in. It was always they were they were going to accept it after Liv died. They were going to accept it via this merger. The Saudis were already in, quote unquote, the official ecosystem with a European tour event a couple of years ago. And then they started this. They just weren't doing it in the proper way, an approved way. But the Saudi money was always going to come into the game in some official sort of uh, approved stamp of approval way. Um, the live stuff just threatened the business. It wasn't about 9-11 families, as we've come to know and, and always knew, probably. And it wasn't about their human rights abuses. Uh, there was a European tour event in the ecosystem with Saudi money. And that's how they got involved. That's really what piqued their interest. And so whether Liv died in a year, they, there was going to be an Aramco series or something, this merger, the Saudi money was always coming. It was never about a, a, some sort of moral stance. Brendan Porath is editor of The Fried Egg, and you should listen to him on the Shotgun Start podcast. Thank you, Brendan. Thank you. Now, Alex Kirshner writes for Slate, and he is the host of, or the co-host of Split Zone Duo, which you can see this Thursday night in Washington, D.C. Get your tickets. You can do that at SplitZoneDuoLive.com. We'd love to see you. Thanks, Alex. Reboot your credit card with Apple Card, the credit card created by Apple. It gives you unlimited daily cash back that you can now choose to grow in a high-yield savings account at 4.15% annual percentage yield. That's more than 10 times higher than the national average savings rate. Apply for Apple Card now in the Wallet app on iPhone and start growing your daily cash with savings today. Apple Card subject to credit approval. Savings is available to Apple Card owners, subject to eligibility requirements. Savings accounts provided by Goldman Sachs Bank USA, member FDIC. National average savings rate is from FDIC website. Terms apply.
And now it is time for After Balls, sponsored by Bennett's Prune Juice, endorsed by Kenny Sailors, who says it was okay. And actually, it is not really time for After Balls, because in lieu of your usual After Ball programming, I have got Louisa Thomas back with me. Hello, Louisa. Hi. And we are going to discuss your great feature story on the pitcher, Daniel Bard. So there have been a bunch of cases in baseball of players who lose the ability to control their throwing, position players and pitchers, Steve Blass, Steve Sachs, Rick Ankeel, a bunch more. Um, but for reasons we'll get into, Bard's story felt different to me in a really fascinating way. Um, so why don't you start by talking about who this guy is and how he got the yips, to use the most common term for this affliction. Well, um, Daniel Bard's story really begins, um, he was a first-round draft pick of the Boston Red Sox in the in the mid two thousands, um, this is the this is how long his his journey is has been. He actually um, got the yips right shortly after he was drafted. He went to instructional league, pitched really well, um, went to his first spring training, and then and then some coaches sort of started messing with his motion a little bit. You know, asking him to tamp down his uh, leg kick. You know, asking about his arm slot, and he sort of started. You know, he actually responded to that really well. He was like, this is great. I'm going to improve. No one's ever really taught me how to pitch before. Um, but his velocity went down. His control kind of, he lost control. And um, it took going to Hawaii um, in the off season and pitching uh, in winter ball and, and kind of like relaxing um, to get his control back. And, you know, when I talked to him, he told me that there are sort of more stories um, like that than you'd, you'd think of. Like a lot of players actually have control problems at, at some point. It's often when they're coming back from an injury and kind of relearning to pitch and, and sort of thinking methodically um, or mechanically through a process that's kind of always come naturally. But for most of them, it actually is it, really just a momentary thing. But there are in these in these um, certain number of instances that you've mentioned some of the famous ones, um, they really kind of take over. And, and that's what happened to Bard a few years later. He became um, a very good reliever, a top reliever for the, the Boston Red Sox. Um, everyone was sort of thinking that he was going to assume the closer's role. Um, he was pitching 100, you know, the throwing 100 mile an hour strikes, and he actually set the Red Sox record for most scoreless innings. Um, the Red Sox have obviously been around for a while, so it was it was a significant record. They had this momentous collapse at the end of 2011, and his he wasn't actually pitching very badly at that point, but um, he had a bad run. He gave up a lot of runs. His ERA was over 10 in that stretch. And um, they tried making him a starter to start the following season. That went really badly, and that's when things really went off the rails. Um, and he spent five years in the minors. He tried everything. He did you know, hyp- hypnosis. He did tapping, this kind of strange technique to sort of reframe traumatic memories. He tried doing whatever he could, you know, meditation, breathing exercises, reading self-help books. Um, traveling, you know, he tried everything, um, and he was just hitting batters right and left. And finally, he retired. So that's sort of what I'd heard of the story because then he came back in 2020. But what was interesting is that most people don't recover, and and he did. That's kind of what I was alluding to in my introduction. I, I guess two things that he's his story is different in that he has gotten the yips and recovered and gotten the yips again multiple times. When we often think of it as like um, not as much of a seesaw, but as just like you hit this peak and then you hit this valley that you're not able to get out of. So that's a little bit different. But the other thing um, that I found a little bit different about him is that when he had this more recent bout with the yips, he went on the disabled list because of anxiety. Like he's actually talked about it and owned it in a way that I feel like other players, um, maybe because of their personalities, maybe because of being of a slightly different generation, kind of were shamed or felt shame about what they were going through. And he doesn't seem to feel the shame in the same way. You know, one of the things he talked about and his wife, Adair, who's also really articulate and and, and open, um, and other people who've gotten the yips have talked about to me, is like the loneliness of the experience. The feeling that you are just kind of, um, I mean, it's so visual in, in baseball too, because you're out on a pitcher's mound. It is like you are on an island. And I think that's a, f- a frightening position for a lot of um, for a lot of people to be in. And, you know, there are good reasons and there are bad reasons why, um, there are mostly bad reasons why mental healthness continues to be this kind of 
there's still a stigma around this kind of stuff. Um, you know, that people want to be tough. They want to be able to compete under pressure. You know, we lionize guys who go out in hard situations and, and, and shut people down, you know, pitchers who just can, can do that. And the funny thing is that, you know, Daniel Bart has done that. It's not that he's not able to perform under pressure. He is um, absolutely shown that he could do that. Um, but, you know, something, something happens and it's mysterious and there are different explanations for why it happens. And, and that's kind of frightening too. The uncertainty, I think, is another thing that, um, that a lot of people um, are in, make, that makes people uncomfortable and, and certainly also probably makes um, front offices um, uncomfortable too. Yeah, last question before we kind of take the rest of this to the Slate Plus segment. Um, there's this moment in the World Baseball Classic where he loses control. You describe it in the piece. And he actually broke Jose Altuve's hand with a pitch that was just like wildly off target. And I'm wondering if you talked to him about that moment. I mean, you said that his brother kind of hypothetically was like players were afraid. But in this case, he actually injured another player. Um, and that must have been um, tough for him to deal with. Oh, yeah. Um, that was a really dark time. Um, you know, I text him um, right after it happened, and he had always been very quick to respond. Um, and we'd been kind of in a great rhythm of talking. Um, and, it, it, you know, it took him a while to write back. I mean, took a n- more prodding later. Um, and I, you know, I wasn't really sure um, how he was going to respond um, after that happened. Um, I have to say that this is the part of the story that I now find actually more remarkable than his comeback to become one of the best closers in baseball. Um, you know, I, I actually think in some ways, you know, he still has control issues. You know, he is not, you know, when you watch him now, he's still like bouncing balls in the dirt. He's still throwing wild pitches. He is still pitching though. And how he has sort of managed to um, deal with yeah, obviously the trauma is to Jose Altuve. Like, you know, Dana Bart's hand's not the one who got broken. But, um, you know, it, it's horrifying. It was horrifying for him. It was horrifying for everybody who watched um, to see that happen and how he was able to um, both t- actually take a break, you know, call it what it was instead of saying like, you know, arm fatigue or bad back or something that, you know, a lot of times, you know, we all know examples um, of players who have been struggling with something psychologically and have, have gone on the DL with some, you know, fake injury or or real injury that is sort of like listed as a reason when it's actually something else. He really wanted to face this head on. And as I saw it, like the comeback was, he had to sort of like learn to live with himself, you know, and learn to live with this these yips and learn to pitch with this. And um, what he's doing now in some ways is even more incredible than then, yeah, blowing guys away um, as he once did. So we will continue this uh, conversation in our Slate Plus segment. But for now, that is our show. Our producer is Kevin Bendis. To listen to past shows and subscribe or just reach out, go to slate.com slash hangup. And you can email us at hangup at slate.com. And please subscribe and rate and review us on Apple Podcasts. For Louisa Thomas, I'm Josh Levine. Remember Zelma Beatty, and thanks for listening. 